Hi, welcome to our Thursday, every other Thursday, Facebook Live. I'm Tom with Midwest Native Skills, and thanks for joining us. Uh, today's topic is going to be winter preparedness for your home and cars. So uh, I want this to be a very interactive little session. So please, uh, I'd like you to uh, write in any comments you have, uh, any ideas you have. I have uh, some ideas here. Uh, that I came up with, uh, which is kind of uh, survival twisted a little bit, a little twist toward the survival aspect. But uh, staying in your home when the power's out for a storm or, or for whatever emergency uh, could get into a survival situation. And it's that survival mentality, uh, making do with what you have, but also planning ahead and being prepared for these situations that could uh, turn a uh, emergency in uh, situation into just a normal routine. Hey, we're going to uh, just go ahead with our lives the way we planned for it. So uh, it always amazes me uh, when there's a, uh, uh, a bad storm coming or some kind of disruption in our normal routine. You always hear on the news the lines at the supermarket are long or the shelves are bare and people are waiting for, you know, no toilet paper and, and all this. It's like, don't they realize that these things are reoccurring? And if you had to wait in line once, I could understand you, you were unaware. The second time, you know it's going to happen. So when things are all normal, stock up on the stuff. Stock up on a little bit of food. Stock up on your toilet paper. So you're not one of those people waiting in line when the prices are a little bit higher and uh, everybody else is out there waiting in line. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, Oh, we still have classes coming up. We have studying classes coming up in November. Uh, our survival classes are uh, are pretty much uh, uh, done for uh, this year, 2021. But uh, we are getting signups for next year, and they also make great Christmas presents. So you can keep that in mind if you want to give somebody uh, a Christmas present. And if you do give them, they are 100% refundable in case you give a uh, survival class or one of our homesteading classes to someone and they decide it's not for them. We'll give you your money back without a problem. Any ideas you have as we go through some of these topics, I'd like to know some of your comments. So please, please write in. So um, it was some changing of the seasons. Uh, getting your home and your car ready for some of these emergencies just makes sense. So uh, we're going to go through some topics. And I'd like you to have a mindset, assuming that you're going to be without power or without your normal routine where you can just go to the store, go to an ATM, go get gasoline or, or what you need for about a week. Because in a week's time, things should get relatively back to normal. But if you can think of that week, um, that would be a, a, a good time frame to, to think about. Let's first start with the home. And I'm going to do a broad spectrum thing. Uh, uh, one thing... Uh, uh, Cheryl brought up on preparedness. Now, she's got a gardening mindset, which is great. Uh, she said, make sure you plant your bulbs outside. This would be the time of year to do that so that they're going to be popping up in the spring. So if you want your yard to look good in the spring, now's the time to go put your 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 bulbs out and, and plant them for the spring. Now, this is not emergency prepared, but it is preparing for the spring. Another thing around your house, uh, clean out your gutters. Now, you want to do this after all the leaves fall, uh, but when all the ice and stuff gets gets going and the snow and stuff, you don't want clogged gutters because what's that's going to happen? It's going to back up, you're going to have water damage, and you're going to have a lot more expense. Yes, it's a pain to get up there uh, to, to clean out the gutters. It's a messy job. No one likes to do it. Just be careful doing it. Make sure you have uh, someone holding the ladder for you. But it's something we all should do. And we can go, you know all about the gutter guards and all that. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive if you get them at Lowe's. They do help. They're not perfect, but they will help you out. Uh, furnace things. Furnace around the house. Now, we all know that uh, in the list of survival uh, the this, this sacred order of survival when we're in the woods, we always do shelter, fire, water, and food. So uh, at our house, we have our shelter with the structure we have. Fire, 
That has to do with keeping you warm, keeping your house warm. Water, self-explanatory, and food, also self-explanatory. So let's, uh, our shelter, keep your gutters and all that clean. Make sure that your shingles on your roof are good and all that. Fire would be your furnace. Make sure you have a new filter in your furnace. It's the time to do it. Get your furnace uh, filter size. They're usually pretty simple to do. You just take out the old filter, slide in the new one. Uh, it's going to make your furnace work less, work more efficiently, cut down your gas bill, and uh, it's just a smart thing to do. Now's the time to do it in October. Uh, if you're not handy, maybe now's the time to, uh, to call an HVAC company when they're not busy, when they're not going to charge you a premium. Have them come, put a couple drops of oil on the uh, uh, motor if you have an, uh, an oilable motor. They can check everything out, check to make sure the belts are good. Or if you're a little handy, you can do that yourself. If your furnace has a belt, you can just take a visual look at it. If it's all cracked and things, you probably need a new belt. If it looks relatively new without cracks, the belt's probably good. Uh, another thing you should do, uh, this goes with water, but on the outside, we want to shut off the outside water going to our outside faucets. We don't want that to freeze. Now, some of you might have special outside faucets that are frost resistant, but most of us don't. So you want to make sure you shut off the water to your outside faucets. Uh, when you do that, make sure you open up your outside faucets. So if there's any water in the lines, it has some room to expand so it doesn't freeze. Crack your pipes, break your pipes. We don't want that to happen. Uh, this one is real important. It's going to cause you tons or avoid you having tons of grief in the spring. We're almost at the end of the grass cutting season. When you cut your grass for the last time, you want to drain your lawnmower of all the gasoline that's in it. And this goes for any kind of lawn equipment you have. The gasoline that we're getting these days is really poor quality. It actually starts going bad. And by bad, I mean it's not going to... Uh, uh, be good enough to start the engines very well after about a month or two. And after three or four months, it's really junk. It's going to start clogging up and causing varnish in your carburetors to a point where you the, the uh, motor won't start. You're going to have to take that carburetor to a small engine repair place and pay anywhere from 80 to a hundred plus dollars to have that little carburetor rebuilt. It can get pretty expensive. So what you want to do this time of year after you cut your grass for the last time or use your leaf blower for the last time, take that gasoline and responsibly spill it out, take it to a recycling place, call your city to find out how you can get rid of that gasoline in, re in a responsible way. Then start that lawnmower up. It'll still start because there'll be still gasoline in the carburetor and let it run until it runs out of gas. Then we know there's no gasoline in the uh, uh, gas tank, and there's no gasoline in the carburetor. Now, it'll store for uh, the winter time. Come spring, you put fresh gasoline in it, start right up, you won't have any problems. That's a, that's a tip that could save you a lot of money and a lot of aggravation come uh, April when it's time to restart that up. Few other things. Uh, Check batteries in your smoke detectors. They always say check that uh, when we change the clocks. That's a good idea, but just keep that in mind. If you want to stay on that uh, routine of when we set the clocks back, that'll be in November sometime. Uh, that's fine, but just keep that in mind that we need to start checking uh, or change the batteries in our smoke detectors, our CO2 uh, uh, detectors, or some of you might have radon detectors uh, twice a year. It's good protection, it's good peace of mind. We need to keep your family safe. And for the price of some AA or some nine volt batteries, it's great insurance. So those are a few, uh, few little things on that. Uh, also for an emergency, you should have flashlights around with good batteries or your camping gear lights. So check those out. Now, if they have rechargeable batteries in them, 
you should be checking, uh, recharging those batteries once every couple months, even if you're not using them. Remember, rechargeable batteries have a natural uh, 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 cycle when they get discharged just by sitting there and not being used. Rule of thumb is the old nickel cadmium batteries is about 1% per day. So in 30 days, even though you're not using that piece, that a piece of equipment with those rechargeable batteries, in 30 days, they'll be 30% discharged, even though you didn't use them. The lithium batteries, the lithium ion rechargeable batteries, they don't discharge quite as bad, but just to be on the safe side, you want to recharge those. Wouldn't be a bad idea to recharge them on the first of the month, just as a reminder. It's a good note. First of the month, I got to recharge the batteries in, in my rechargeables. So if there's an emergency, power goes out, you'll have lights. They'll be your camping gear lights, but that's okay. They'll be recharged. Know where they're at. Other things, emergency water supplies. Now, there could be a boil order. There could be a lot of different things. So you, it's not a bad idea to have water uh, stored away. Now, we all have, or most of us have, water tanks at home. They're 40-gallon or 60-gallon hot water tanks. Now, if there's ever a water contamination in your community, what's the first thing you want to do is shut off the water supply coming into your home. So everyone in your house should know where your main incoming water supply shutoff valve is. Reason for this is the water in your tank is safe. We want to isolate that from any contaminated water coming into your house. It makes sense. So that means we want to shut that water off before anybody flushes a toilet, turns on a water spigot, or anything like that. So everyone should know where that hot, where that valve is to shut off your water. And then we want to make sure that valve is workable. Make sure it's not rusted and frozen, and that everybody from grandma to your seven-year-old can actually turn that valve off and on. Locate the valve, find that. So when they turn that off, you have 40 to 60 gallons of good water. That's quite a bit of water. You might also want to store water. Remember, water never goes bad. Water will last a thousand years. Now, after a couple weeks, if your, store, your stored water might have a little funny taste to it, that doesn't mean it's bad, it's just not aerated. To get that water to taste good again, simple matter of just pouring it from one glass to another, that's gonna re-aerate it, it'll taste just fine. You should also have a way to purify water. Simplest way is just have a bottle of bleach, the kind that you use for your laundry. This has to be the cheapest kind of bleach you can get. Make sure it has no scent, no coloring, go to your dollar store and get a bottle of bleach. Now, I like to replace that bleach that I have just for water purification about every year. After a year, the bleach starts to lose its strength. But what do we do with that old bottle of bleach? Simple, we use it for our laundry. So it never goes to waste. So have a way to purify water. And remember, the ratio of bleach is eight drops per gallon will purify a gallon of water. And remember, when you're purifying water with a chemical like bleach, it has to sit 30 minutes to kill Giardia and four hours to kill Cryptosporidium. So basically, you're not sure if either of those is in the water, so I just leave it sit for four hours and then the water is safe to drink. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? Plan a warming center for your house. Now, if you do lose power or natural gas or you can't nor keep your house warm the, nor the normal way you do, don't have to panic. What you do have to do, though, is pick one room in your house that you're going to keep warm. So you're not trying to keep your whole house warm, just one room. Make it a small room. Then what you want to do, that'll be your warm room. You're going to go to all your bedrooms, get all the mattresses, and you're going to bring them to that one room, 
and you're going to build a fort. Remember when you were a kid, how you build a fort? You put some walls up and the top on it. That's what you're going to do. So you're going to build a little fort inside this one room. That's where you're going to sleep. So you're going to build a room inside of a room. And those mattresses are going to be the walls. And so you're going to keep this little mattress fort warm. And you're going to put your blankets in there or sleeping bags if you have them. So you're just trying to keep this one room warm. Now, how are you going to keep the room warm? Well, candles do a pretty good job of getting the chill off a room. It's not going to get it warm, but it'll take the chill off. If that room has a fireplace or a pot belly stove, that's the way you're going to do it as long as you have dried wood outside. So if you're living in a place where you have a pot belly stove, that would be my choice for that warm room. And I'd have, I'd have a, quite, amount, uh, quite a good bit of wood outside, at least a quart of wood that's been drying for at least one year, accessible to me, and keep that wood, and that would be my backup emergency wood. Now, there's a couple other ways. You can go get a, uh, some kind of heating system. Now, I'm not suggesting going out buying an electric heater because if there's an emergency, chances are you're not going to have electric power either because the power lines would be down. Uh, my backup is a kerosene heater. You can get those at Lowe's. They're probably $70. Now, first question people have is, what about the kerosene fumes? Yes, they do give out carbon monoxide. So most homes aren't that tight where it's going to keep all the uh, carbon monoxide fumes in the room. If you have a brand new house, your house might be insulated that tight. So you're going to have to actually crack a window open. Even though you're trying to keep your house uh, warm, you want some ventilation in there because you don't want carbon monoxide poisoning. You are not going to keep this kerosene heater going at night. It would be something in the daytime, but at night you're going to be in your little fort made out of mattresses in your sleeping bag with your blankets over you. Kerosene heater off. So is a kerosene heater ideal and optional? No. But remember, this is an emergency situation and you're going to have to take some calculated risks. This, using a kerosene heater, is a calculated risk. So I'll leave that up to you if you want to use that kerosene heater. We have two kerosene heaters here, and uh, we're, you know, in an emergency situation, we'll use them. But they are kind of a last resort. If it's sub-zero, the house is getting really cold, and we need to use them, we're going to we're going to use them. Uh, if we don't need to use them, we're going to find other means like our fireplace and things until it gets to that point. So. You have to use your head and, and just determine what risk you want to take and what the situation is. Um, uh, check your stash for hygiene products. Now's the time to get your hygiene products. Now's the time to get toilet paper. How much toilet paper do you use in a week? Check it out. This upcoming week, actually calculate how much toilet paper you use. And so you can stock up on that much, but I would... Why not get two or three times that amount? You'll use it. It's, that money's not going to waste, and then you don't have to stand in those long lines. So I always have, we upstairs, we have probably two months' worth of toilet paper. <laughs> so we have plenty of that, more than enough. And uh, in a real emergency, uh, toilet paper is, is a good trade item if it ever got that bad, which I doubt if it will, but it's good, not going to go to waste. So... Stock up on other things, toothpaste. And you don't have to stock up on months worth, but have enough where you don't have to go running to the store in case of an emergency. Uh, have a battery-operated radio around because you want to be in communication to find out what's going on in the outside world. So make sure you have a, a battery-operated radio. Uh, I don't want to turn this into an uh, advertisement for some of our products that we sell, but our Kaido radio, it's a pretty inexpensive radio. Uh, we have an analog version with a dial, and we have a digital version, which is a little more accurate. And the analog is around $60, and the digital is $99. But this radio 
is an AM FM. It has no weather bands. It has the shortwave bands, all seven of them. And it has uh, several ways to recharge it. Uh, it'll work off 110 volts so you can plug it in the wall if you have power. If you don't have power, it works off uh, battery. It, work, it has a crank so you can crank power it. It's got a generator built in. It works off solar. Uh, it has a built-in rechargeable battery. Uh, it works off 12 volts, so if you have a car, you can plug it in at 12 volts. It has a lot of different ways uh, to uh, power the radio, so that would be a good choice. There's others out there, uh, but this is the best value we found. So a radio like that would be definitely good to have for an emergency. Uh, Wendy wants to know, on the gas, how long can you store gas for a generator and will it keep over the winter? Gasoline? That's an easy answer. No. Gasoline in a container, figure one month. If you put that uh, additive in called stable, that will extend the gasoline to about three months. The gasoline that they're putting out uh, uh, in the last two years, Wendy, is crap. It's terrible gasoline. It's eating, uh, because of the alcohol they're putting into it, it's eating the rubber parts, it's eating gaskets, it's causing carburetors to, to not function the way they're supposed to. Uh, it's not lasting. In the old days, gasoline would last about six months. If you put the stable in, it would last a year. That's no longer the case. Without stable, one month. With the stable, three months. So uh, gas is, is terrible. Uh, so that's what we have to live with. Okay, uh, fire extinguishers. Uh, especially with Christmas coming up, you should always have a fire extinguisher around, but we always hear about people's house burning down because of trees, you know, Christmas trees, electrical things. Uh, now you probably, on fire extinguishers, uh, they have uh, classifications of fire extinguishers, and they're labeled A, B, and C. If you get an, a fire extinguisher with an A classification, that means that fire extinguisher is good for paper fires. Papers, garbage, things like that, wood fires, that's what it's designed to put out. If you get one with a B classification, it's made for a liquid fire, like a gasoline fire some liquid that's burning. A C-rated fire extinguisher is for an electrical fire. So, they also make a fire extinguisher that has an A, B, C classification. That's the kind I like to get. So it will put out wooden paper, it will put out a liquid fire, and it will put out an electrical fire. So it'll put out all three. So you could get one that's just for wood, A, just for liquid, B, just for electrical, C, or one that's an A, B, and C. So if your Christmas tree catches on fire, that would typically be just an A fire. But since you have lights on there, it could be a C fire. So technically, all you need is an A, C classification fire extinguisher which they might make, I'm not sure, but just get an ABC, and then you're covered on all, all grounds, and they're not that much more expensive. So then if you had a grease fire in your kitchen, which would be considered an, a li liquid fire, use it for that. So you're covered on all grounds. Okay. Now, you know I love pets, so we can't forget our pets. Make sure that they have their medications, they have enough food uh, and, and all that. Uh, make sure they have at least, you have at least one week extra food for them. And make sure that you have enough medications. If, if you're on some meds, I like to keep aside about two weeks of any medications that uh, you would be on, just in case. And then when you get a new prescription, you can rotate them and put the new medications in your two-week backup supply and then use up your backup supply. Might be a little extra work, but we want to keep everybody safe. So, 
let's go to your car kit. Now, we did a, a YouTube video and a, a Facebook Live on car kits, but I want to add a few things to that because your car really takes a beating in the winter. First thing I want to tell you, and most people don't realize this, in the wintertime, your car battery, everybody knows we have a car alternator that charges our battery when we're driving the car. The alternator is designed to maintain your car's battery, typically during the summertime. In the wintertime, just think what we're asking our battery in our car to do. We have, it's running the car, but we have our heater on, which is using the battery. We have our radio going. We have our defrosters going. We have our headlights on. We have our wipers going. We're asking a lot of electrical demand on our electric system. That battery's really got its work cut out for it. The alternator is not really designed to constantly put up with that much drain. So, a couple things we need to do. Before you turn off your car, I want you to turn off all of your accessories that you've been using when you were driving the car. So, pull in your driveway, turn off the heater, turn off the radio, turn off the wipers, turn off the lights, turn off the defroster. So then when you get in the car the next day and you're starting the car, the starter motor takes a lot of electricity. All you're asking that battery to do is to start the car. It's a lot easier on the battery. Your battery's gonna last a lot longer and it'll start the car a whole lot easier than trying to start your car as well as power your lights and all the other accessories that you forgot to turn off. I'm just trying to be a little nicer to your car so it'll start in those cold, cold days. So just turn everything off when you get home. Yeah, it's a little more work for you, but it'll be a lot nicer on the car. Now, if you want to be, if you want to extend the life of your car's battery, that's easy to do. A car battery typically will last about four years. If your car battery is four years old, you better start putting money away to buy a new one. And a new battery is anywhere from about $150 to $200 these days. You can extend that four years to six or seven years if you put a charge on the battery or put your battery on a battery charger once a month throughout the year. Now, you can go to an auto parts store and buy a battery charger. They're usually about 10 amps. A 10 amp battery charger is what you're looking for. And it'll be about $100. All you do is you're going to connect the battery charger, the red to the positive side, the plus side of the battery. There'll be a plus on your battery. And the black side or the negative to the negative side of the battery. Plug it in and the battery charger does the rest. Keep that battery charger on for just 12 hours. Do that once a month. You're going to add two or even three years to the life of the battery. It just brings the battery charge all the way up and... It does wonders for the battery's life. That's all you have to do. Don't have to do it, but then your battery will last about a good four years. So those are just some tips on your, on your car's battery. Okay, things in the back seat, in the trunk that you might want to put in there. Blankets. If you ever get stranded on some out-of-the-way road, you might need those blankets to keep warm. I, you know me with my wool. I love wool blankets. Some of those heat reflector blankets, those reflectors, uh, those are great blankets to have too. So I would have a heat reflective blanket and a wool blanket. And I'd have one for everybody that you expect to have in the car. So I definitely have one for myself as the driver, but I'd have at least one extra because you might have one extra passenger. So that would be two of them. So uh, that would be something you want to have. I'd have some fire starting materials there and make it easy. I like those ferro rods. One of my favorite fire starters, and if you ever were in a survival class of mine, those blast matches. Now, I'm a big advocate of primitive fire starting. You know me. I love my flint and steel and my bow drill. But if you're stranded on the side of a road in a snowstorm, that's no time to try to be primitive. You want a fire and you want it now. So in my fire kit for my car, my first line of defense would be a Bic lighter. Second line of defense would be a blast match. 
and uh, then I'd have some jute tinder there. Now the blast match is going to work, or the lighter should work. Now remember, in cold weather, you might have to hold that lighter in your hand or put it under your armpits to warm up the butane. You might have to hold it there for about 30 seconds, then it'll work. The blast match, that's going to work no matter what the temperature is. You want to put some jute tinder in there. Now, some of you might say, oh, I'm going to put uh, dryer lint there. Dryer lint will work as long as you got it out of your dryer with 100% cotton when you were drying it. If there's any polyester in there, it won't work near as good. I'd also have some fire starters in there. There's a lot of fire starters out there. My favorite is um, the Landman fire starters. They're small. They burn about six minutes. They burn hot. And you can put a lot of them because they, they store flat. But there's others like the wet fire and there's several others. But have a fire starter that you've used before and you have confidence in. Uh, so you want to have some fire starters just in case you need to start a fire. Uh, I have some water purification uh, material there. If you want to put some water purification tablets in, you can. If you want to put a little container of bleach in there, you can do that. Uh, I also have a pot in there, just in case. Small pot. You can store a lot of this in that pot. You can have your fire starting material in that pot and put it all in there, just in case you need to, uh, to, to boil something. You don't know where you're going to be lost, so you're going to have some of this. Here is a just um, flare. I'm glad you brought that up. I knew that in the back of my head, but it just slipped my mind. A road flare is an excellent way to start a fire. And now I would say at least have three road flares because you could use a road flare to signal a person. You could use it on the side of the road to, uh, as, as, to warn people that you're broken down, and you could use it as a fire starter. In fact, I'd probably put six in my car then you have more than enough. You're not trying to ration them. Excellent idea, and that just slipped my mind. Road flares are fantastic. And what's nice about them, you don't need uh, a match or anything to light them. You just pull off the cap and, and pull them. Yep. Yeah, I just have here a container to store all your items in, in a tin which can be used to boil water. Yep. Signaling materials, that would be the flare and a flashlight. Uh, they have such good flashlights these days. They're awfully bright. And again, when you're using batteries on any flashlights for an emergency material, again, you want those lithium batteries in there. Those EverReady uh, silver lithium batteries, those that last 20 years, because when there's a flashlight in your car, you might not use it for five years. If you have those lithium batteries, you know they're gonna work. So, uh, also in the trunk of your car, I would have a small uh, bag of salt, and I'd have a small shovel in there. Salt, because you can always throw that under your tires in case you get stuck. Snow shovel, believe it or not, I've seen cars get stuck in this much snow just because the tires start spinning. All it takes is for you to dig some snow out and get that little rut that the tire made. Just let the car get a little bit of uh, a, a traction and it'll walk right out of those places. But you think, oh, I could do that with my hands. Really? Have a good pair of extra gloves because a lot of times the gloves we take are for fashion and they're not rugged gloves that you're gonna need to dig out, dig out your car. If you want to go a little extra, oh, one thing that is a must that everyone listening and tell your friends you must have in your car, a pair of jumper cables. If your battery goes dead and you need a jump for somebody, most people are more than willing to help you. They'll stop, they'll pop their hood, you connect the cars up, and you, they'll give you a jump to start your car. Most people are willing to do that. Most people don't have jumper cables. So it's up to you to have these jumper cables in your car. My suggestion, make sure that they're long.
to get the longest pair you can. And you should get as heavy of a gauge wire as you can also. They're going to carry the most power. And uh, so by what gauge? I would say 14 gauge would be good if you can find 12 gauge. And they'll say on the jumper cable, these are 14 gauge. These are 12 gauge. Uh, those would be good, heavy jumper cable. If, uh, 10 gauge is probably you can't find them that heavy. If I could find 10 gauge, I'd buy them. But 12 gauge would be fine. 14 gauge would be okay. 16 is getting light. 18 is getting too light. Uh, length, 8 foot's good. 10 foot would be better. 10 foot's good. 12 foot would be better. And 12 foot's good, but 14 foot would be better. So longer, longer is better on that. And uh, the correct way to jumper a car pretty simple. Always connect the red, the positive first, then connect the black to the cars. Then you let the cars be hooked up together and rev up the engine on the donor car, on the car that's giving the power for about five minutes. Rev it up to, well, a high idle, not crazy high, but you want the engine speed to come up a little bit so it can charge the dead car. And do that for about five minutes. Don't just hook them up and try starting the dead car. It won't work. Give it five minutes. After five minutes, have the person, again, keep the donor car, the car that's running, bring up the RPM. If you want a number, about 2,000 RPM. Maybe when you're trying to start the car, maybe 3,000 RPM. Start the, start the dead car. It'll start. So that's how to start it. Then when you unhook the cars, unhook the positive, take off the negative, and uh, thank the person that gave you the jump. That's simple. So those are some of just the basics of getting your house and getting your car ready. Uh, in your car, you could have some power bars too, some... Uh, um, you know, I've seen some good protein bars just for a snack. Keep your energy up. Uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, a good wool tassel cap would be good in case you have to walk someplace. Because if you're, if you're going someplace, you might not always have a hat on. Uh, you know, you're going to someplace fancy. You're not going to be carrying a, a nice warm hat. And that's when you might break down. Uh, if you go to the website, we're going to have a place that will have this list of things. So if you think, my God, he covered a lot. It would be, uh, just type in survivalschool.com slash winter dash prep dash list slash. And we'll put that up on the screen. So that'll take you to this list, and uh, so you can print it out. Share the list with some of your friends. Help them out. But if anything, uh, shutting off everything on your car would be the one thing I would really want you to take away from this when you get home. So when you start it, everything's not blaring and you're taxing your battery. And the second thing is go to uh, auto parts store or Walmart or someplace and get those jumper cables. They will save your tail. Anyone else with any comments? Yeah, Adam has an emergency tarp that has a reflective side and a waterproof top side. That way he can either wrap it around himself or use it as a shelter. Fantastic idea, Adam. Fantastic idea. You know, one of those poncho uh, raincoats might not be a bad idea because, uh, you know, we're thinking, okay, you're in a winter storm, but you know what? You might get stranded in one of these days when it's 33 degrees and sleeting and raining on you and you have to walk someplace. And there's nothing more miserable than walking and getting all your clothes wet and it's 33 degrees outside. So some kind of rain gear might be also a real good thing to uh, add in your emergency kit. Because that 33 degrees sleeting rain is more miserable than having it 20 degrees and snowing on you. But that tarp would be a great idea, especially with that reflective uh, 
uh, covering. Yep. Another thing you might want to do to your car, check your tires. Uh, another thing uh, about tire pressure, uh, where you want to get the correct inflation for your tire is not off the tires. The, the inflation numbers on your tire is the maximum the tires can hold. So your car's going to run ride terribly and you're going to have terrible wear on your tires. You want to open up the door, your, your driver's door, and there'll be a sticker on your door. That's the correct inflation for your car's tires. Even the owner's manual is not the best place to get it because a lot of times they'll use the same owner's manual in several different models. So the owner's manual isn't the best place. It's that sticker on the driver's door. And most people don't know that. So, so check your air pressure. And why not check it when it's 65 degrees out rather than wait till it's 20 degrees out? Now, granted, when it does get colder, your tire pressure will drop a couple pounds. So maybe now you know it's going to get colder weather. If it says inflate your tires to 35, I might inflate them to 37 in anticipation for the colder weather and the tire pressure dropping a bit. Yep. Open up that uh, driver's door and see what the correct tire pressure is. And the front and backs might be different. And don't forget that spare tire either. Now, that's a real pain if you have to crawl around and get to that spare tire. The spare tires usually are around 60 pounds. It'll be different than your other tires typically. But that spare tire pressure uh, will be on that sticker too. It'll be designated as an SPT. And most people look, well, what the heck is an SPT? Or STP. It stands for spare tire pressure, SP, STP. They use fancy acronyms. But, uh, so if you come up with any other ideas, uh, send me an email because I can update this list. And by all means, this list isn't a complete all encompassing, but it, it's what I came up with kind of off the top of my head and what I do to get prepared. So uh, I can update it on, on the website. So if there's nothing else, appreciate you joining in. And uh, I'm also looking for any new ideas for classes for next year. So if you come up with some, some idea, I'm more than willing to uh, see if we can put the class up for next year. Next year is going to be a real good year. We're adding some new classes. We're adding some intensive classes. So let me know what you'd like to, uh, to have us uh, teach. And if, if I don't know the topic, I'll get an instructor that does. So thanks for joining us. And stay safe, and I'll see you in two weeks.